want to just pray before we get in this. I just want to take some time to thank Pastor Marco Garcia, Lisa Garcia. I met uh, Gabriel in Israel maybe four years ago. And uh, we've been connected ever since. And uh, it's, I believe in God appointments. How many of you believe in kingdom connections here? Right? Let me tell you something. You are only one connection away of the destiny that God has for you. And something that I pray for every morning is, Lord, bring me kingdom connections. Can you pray with me real quick? Just say, Lord, bring me the kingdom connection that will connect me to my kingdom purpose. Come on, praise Lord. Just raise your hands wherever you're at. Raise your hands wherever you're at. Holy Spirit, we thank you in this place. We recognize your, par your presence here. We say we need you this morning. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would impact us today, that you would touch our hearts, touch our spirits. Holy Spirit, you are our helper. Would you help us and guide us in all truth? If you could just put your hand on your heart right now and just repeat after me, Lord God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your transformational power. You've transformed me. You are transforming me. So that I would be an agent of transformation. So this morning, I need you, Holy Spirit. Help me. Convict me. Comfort me. Embrace me. Change me. Renew my mind. Renew in me the first love. I want to learn how to love you. So that I can love my neighbor as myself. Increase hunger, increase faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on and give Jesus a big hand clap. You may be seated. It is such an honor to be with you. I was um, this morning picked up by Gabriel out in uh, Orange County, and we were driving all the way out here, and he's telling me of all that God is doing at the way. Now, how many of you are grateful for kingdom communities around the globe? Come on now. You have an amazing kingdom community. You know why? Because I loved something that I picked up, which was nations. I kept hear hearing about nations. I mean, you're sending a team out to Brazil. We were talking about this uh, in the back room. It's not, it's not coincidence that I'm coming from Brazil and uh, you're sending a team out to Brazil. I, I mean, this is like a, a kingdom family interaction, you know what I mean? And uh, I'm hearing about Kenya, I'm hearing about Mexico, about you guys reaching California. I mean, this is what the kingdom is all about. When I uh, think about what am I living for, I believe that every Christian, every son, every daughter of the king needs to understand that we are living for, for Jesus' last words. If you think about our loved ones and, uh, you know, we, we, we look at our families and maybe you, like many other people like myself, have experienced the loss of a loved one. Uh, if you have the opportunity to spend, you know, the, the last minutes with that loved one, that loved one will tell you the most important thing that he or she wants you to know. Jesus' last words before he ascends, he gathers his disciples and he says, I'm going to give you a commission. These are my last words. These are the most powerful words I could give you. You've been with me for three years. You've seen me heal the sick, cast out demons. You've seen me embrace the marginalized. You've seen me teach the gospel. But, you know, you, you saw me get crucified. You saw me get raised up from the dead. We're here and I'm about to ascend, and you will see me next time in my second coming. But before I go, you need to hear these very, very important words. If I could sum up everything that we're doing here on earth as a kingdom family, it's this. You have a part to play. This part is go make disciples of all nations. He's saying, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them all that I have commanded you. That's the Great Commission. So the Great Commission becomes really our finish line. 
You know, I, I, one of the books that I read when I started uh, uh, getting involved in leadership and ministry, one of my mentors said, you got to read this book, uh, The Seven Effective Habits of, of Leaders, Stephen Covey. And one of them is, every good leader begins anything with the end in mind. So, I, I, you know, I was coming into the faith. I, I, I grew up in church. I, a little bit about me, I'm, I'm, I'm Japanese-Brazilian. So uh, my last name is Hayashi, right? I was just telling the first service crew of my, uh, my uh, cultural conflicts inside of me. Uh, my other half uh, is Italian-Brazilian. So, you know, it, we had great food at home. And uh, I can't complain. And, and I, I remember, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a PK. And we had, you know, growing up in church and everything. I remember when I ended up. In high school, just getting really involved in sports and in soccer in Brazil. Everybody uh, plays soccer, uh, even if you don't want to. And um, he, I, I remember this this coach came up to me and he said, "Yeah, you know, you could play in America, um, and uh, you could uh, get a scholarship." I'm like, "Oh, really?" He's like, "Yeah." And uh, so I, d I decided that I would do that. And uh, while coming here, um, I was telling people the first day in orientation. You know, it's brand new. I'm, I'm coming in. I'm uh, 17, turning 18. Uh, just graduated high school, and uh, it's it's a new experience. And they take me to this orientation at the at the university that I went out in the northeast in Pennsylvania. And then they say, fill out this form. And so I fill out my major, my name, uh, where my dorm building was. And then it comes to a point where it says uh, race, ethnicity. It says white. Black, Hispanic, Latino, Asian, uh, Pacific Islander, and then it had the last one box other. And then so I'm, I didn't know what to, to put there, so I just gave it empty to the lady. And she says, no, no, you, you missed this. Just fill that in. And then she handed it to me. I look at it. I said, I don't know. And then she said, what do you mean you don't know? She's like, uh, she's, she's looking at me. What are you? I'm like, uh, she's like, I, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm Japanese. Well, Asian. But I was born and raised in Brazil. Latino. She looked, oh, you look Filipino. Put Filipino. I'm like. Oh. So I'm thinking if I put Pacific Islander, it's like a lie. So I just put other. And so, uh, but this thing, she told me. She said, uh, oh, she looks and she says, well, just know that you're a minority. And it was like, oh, welcome to America. I was like, oh, Okay. And, and, you know, that thing for me, I, I didn't really understood, uh, understood that, you know. But uh, the thing is, I found a group of friends that were family to me. And uh, I remember that this thing of the minority was kind of like this theme. You know, I've been talking to church leaders as I am myself a church leader. I'm pastoring a, a, a church in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that we are all about church planning like your church is and we have uh, campuses in Europe and in South America. And I was talking to them about 2020, how a lot of us have felt that, you know, so many things have happened to the world. And it, Christianity, in a certain way, it has become seen as this thing that is, like, outdated. This thing, like, these morals, this, this worldview that you believe in the Bible. It's, like, being questioned. And, and I talk to young people. I mean, that's the demographic. A, a lot of young, young adults that I uh, deal with. And they, they're saying... I feel like I'm a minority. And they're not talking ethnically or racially. They're talking when I go to the marketplace in my workplace or, or where I, the gym that I work out or, you know, my high school friends when we do reunions or my family, extended family. I, I'm, the, I'm the part, the, the small part that believes what I still believe in the Bible. I feel like I'm a minority. You know, I... I I am a product of missions. That's why I believe in missions so much. The, the, the way my family made it from Japan to Brazil was because they were missionaries sent to plant churches for the Japanese community in Brazil. I don't know if you are aware of this, but the biggest population of Japanese people outside Japan is in Brazil. I live in a city called Sao Paulo of 14 million people. And out of the 14 million people, 300,000 are Japanese. And so I say that to you because I'm a product of missions because my grandparents that were sent as missionaries were reached by British missionaries sent to Japan. 
Now think about that. If you start tracing back your, your spiritual lineage, it always involves missionaries. Right? And then you'll go all the way back to Matthew 28. When Jesus is saying, you guys are missionaries. What do you mean missionaries? Because you are called for a mission. A mission? Yes, a great mission that you can't fulfill by yourself. Therefore, it becomes a co-mission. It's so all of us together in this mission fulfilling the great commission. How about that? We are all product of missions. And so as, I, as I'm thinking of, about, you know, 2020 and 2021 and how so much has changed, people are saying, I feel like I'm a minority. And when I look at the word, you know, I just see that the kingdom of God, you know, it's a kingdom that it's upside down. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus is always talking about the kingdom. But when he talks about the kingdom, he wants to make sure that you know that my kingdom is not of this world. It's not even my message here, but if you, if you want to take a look at Mark 1.15, Jesus is really talking about my message. He says, this is, sums up Jesus' message. Mark 1.15, when, when he's saying, hey, the time has come. First thing he says, the kingdom is here. Second thing he says, repent. Third thing he says, and the fourth he says, believe in the gospel. That sums up his message. What he's saying is the time has come. Well, if something is to be fulfilled, it has to be prior to that promised. He was promised. The Messiah will come. That was the promise. And when that phrase was spoken, the Messiah will come, it brought the idea the Messiah always comes with the kingdom. Now, you got to understand that the Jews at the time were under the oppression of the Roman Empire. So in their minds, they're thinking, oh, the Messiah is going to come, the deliverer of Israel. He's going to overtake, militarily speaking, all of these Roman empires, these centurions that are oppressing us. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. My kingdom is not of this world. So a lot of time we feel like we're minority because we think that his kingdom is of this world. But when you understand that the kingdom is not of this world... You start understanding why he would teach us about the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Right? See, this is the thing. Everyone here, if you believe in Jesus and you're saying, Lord, I'm in this for the Jesus mission. Let me tell you, you automatically have become a kingdom ambassador. Right? Are you ready? Are you ready to represent the kingdom of God? Well. A kingdom ambassador. Think about this. You know what this is? Even between the 9 o'clock and the 11 o'clock service, I've been hearing about what you guys are doing. And I said, Lord, this truly is an embassy. See, let me, let me tell you what's, what, 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 how an embassy works. If you go to Washington, D.C., there are embassies in Washington, D.C., there is a Brazilian embassy in Washington, D.C. And when you go into the gates through or the doorway of that embassy, you are in Brazilian territory. Are you following? But it's in Washington, D.C. But when you come in to the, through those gates, through that door, you're in Brazilian territory. Which means that in that piece of property in Washington, D.C., the president of Brazil has authority. The constitution of Brazil has authority. People that are working in there are Brazilian citizens. Over there, they're going to serve you coffee like we drink coffee in Brazil. How about that? They're going to serve you some pão de queijo, some churrasco, some Brazilian steakhouse, hopefully. They're going to have some samba playing in the background. Bossa Nova. Why? Because you're in Brazilian property. Now let me ask you, when you go into the embassy in Washington, D.C., will you see the Christ in Rio de Janeiro in the embassy? Will you see the Amazon River in the embassy? Because the fullness of Brazil is not in the embassy. 
You get that? So when people come in to a church, they should be coming into a kingdom embassy. Check this out. Check this out. They're coming into a kingdom embassy. You are serving the community like a kingdom citizen would serve the future kingdom citizens. And so we're serving them. And they're asking, they're saying, hey, man, what's the kingdom? And you'll, you'll sit down and you'll open the word. You'll teach them this is the kingdom. And where will you teach them? In the constitution of your kingdom. Because in the Brazilian embassy in Washington, D.C., what is good there is not the American constitution. It's the Brazilian constitution. And I'll tell them in the constitution, you have this right. You don't have that right. In the constitution, it says you're this, you're not that. It's talking about identity. It's talking about rights. Does that make sense? So when people come into this place, you're saying, let me tell you, as a kingdom citizen, this is your identity. This is what you have the right for. In the name of Jesus, you have the right to be free. In the name of Jesus, you have the right to have life. In the name of Jesus, you have the right to have life in abundance. Somebody's got to teach them the Constitution. This process of teaching the Constitution is what we call discipleship. Does that make sense? And then somebody will ask you, hey, all right, I get it. You're a kingdom representative, and you're telling me that now I can be part of this kingdom. And uh, you're telling me that the Bible is the kingdom's constitution. And you're telling me that the kingdom's king, his name is Jesus Christ. Uh, I get it. And you're telling me that Jesus Christ came to give me life and life in abundance. I get it. But how come we still have so much darkness out there? And then I'll tell them, we are living in a time and age where we still don't have the fullness of the kingdom in the embassy. You get it? So we're in attention. So we're representing a kingdom, but we're waiting for him to come back. And we're saying, as we're waiting for him to come back, I am training you to rule and reign with him as we go into the constitution. Does that make sense? Now, why is that important? Because all of that was written down the plan called the Great Commission. And so as we look into what we're going to go into the scriptures today, I just want to, I, I don't want you to come into this thinking, man, I, I, I'm just happy to be saved. Being saved is the great, great thing to do, and it's just the beginning. And I know today many people will have an encounter with Jesus like I did. Like Pastor Mark just shared about his, his amusement park encounter. Come on. But let me tell you, when you get saved, it's not over. When you get saved, it's actually just getting started. See, this, the altar is not the finish line. The altar is the starting point. Tail, where is the finish line? I'm going to tell you that the finish line is Matthew 28. It's the Great Commission, and we're in this process of being kingdom ambassadors until he comes with the fullness of the kingdom. Does that make sense? So what are we doing here? We're transforming. We've been changed to change. We've been transformed to transform. And so as we look at the word, I want to just encourage you. You may think, I am a minority, but Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like leaven. You are the leaven that is placed inside the dough of society. You may think I am so small, but let me tell you, there is no dough that when leaven, is com when leaven comes in contact, that his con the leaven's contact will be unnoticed. It's always changing. Something's going to happen. When you are placed in the marketplace, when you are placed in that campus, in your neighborhood, when you are placed in that, you know, the, that, that barbecue with your friends or your high school reunion, let me tell you something. You are the leaven and you're changing and you're going into the dough. A lot of times we have the, 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 the Roman mentality that Jesus was trying to get to them. They think, hey, you think I'm coming here with an army? No, 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 that's not how I do things. My kingdom is not of this world. I'll place you there. You'll be the salt and light of the earth. People are expecting for you to expand a kingdom through military force. I am telling you, if you want to be the first, you be the servant of all. You want to be the first, you be the last. That's how he's saying. And so as we serve commu our communities, as we serve the nations, the Lord is saying, you are preparing to rule and reign with us. Is this good? Is, is this helping you? All right. Now, real quick, three quick concepts 
Three quick co concepts of kingdom transformation. Why am I saying that? Because I believe God is calling this church. And uh, we were talking, Pastor Marco says, the Lord is preparing the way for the nations. Are you, are you, are you okay with that? Are you okay to impact nations? So as you go to nations, let me say something to you. Esther chapter 4 brings us a powerful concept here. You know, a lot of the things that I, I hear young people say is, man, I've been hurt by the church. Man, I, I had faith in a leader and, th and that leader put me down. And, 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 I, and I know all of that. And I know that sometimes our, our, our generation can be a little bit of a victim mentality. I, I, I get that. But see, this is the thing. You know, and, and I say this with the fear of the Lord, you know, that I, I believe we're coming into a place where we've got to be very conscious that the Lord has given us time, the Lord has given us talent, the Lord has given us treasure to be used for a purpose. The Lord has not give, given you talents and given you the skill and given you the favor just for you to learn for, to, to live for something small. The Lord wants us to live for something big as discipling nations. So when we look at Esther, Chapter 4, she had influence. What, 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 what made Esther influential? Esther was influential because she was gorgeous. She was beautiful. And, and, and maybe I, I can imagine Esther asking herself in the miracle, why, God, did you make me so beautiful? I, I sometimes ask that question myself. But I mean, no, just kidding. Uh, but I could see her thinking, why am I so gorgeous? I mean, it's, it, and, and I feel like Mordecai, her cousin that raised her up was saying, you're not just gorgeous just so you become the most popular girl in high school. You, you're gorgeous for something greater. Right? You, you're not a great athlete just so that you become the superstar in your high school. There's something greater. You're not just that guy that knows how to network and connect people just to be a popular guy. There's something greater. You're not just good at math just so you can go make your own money. There's something greater. You have a talent, and I'm here to tell you, you're talented. Say to your neighbor, you're talented, but there's something greater. Does that make sense? Mordecai was that voice saying, hey, there's something greater. So she becomes the winner of the beauty pageant, marries the most powerful man on the face of the earth at that time. It was this Persian king. And this Persian king is about to exterminate all the Jews, but he did not know that she was a Jewish girl. So Mordecai is on the outside of the palace trying to get her to understand a message. Hey, you're there for something greater. And the verse, chapter 4, verse 13 says, Mordecai told them, the messengers, to answer to Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace. Say with me, king's palace. See, this is the thing. She became so influential, she now has a palace. She became so influential that she could actually hide herself from her purpose in her influence. And he, he's calling her out. He's saying, hey, I know you got a lot of influence, but don't forget why you have a lot of influence. There is a vision. There is a purpose. And because of that purpose, he's given you that talented. He, that talent, he's given you that treasure. He's given you that time. There's something greater. That's what he's saying. And then he goes on to say in verse 14, if you remain completely silent at this time. Tell your neighbor and say, I need your voice. Say, we need your voice. See, it's very comfortable if you're in the palace, although you have a voice to cause change, to be thinking about my influence is at risk if I fulfill my mission. And he's saying, hey, we need your voice. If you remain silent, God's going to use somebody else. God's going to bypass you because his purposes will be fulfilled. I remember when I was a, a youth pastor out in North Carolina at an African-American church where my spiritual dad, he still is the senior leader there. Uh, he, we would, I would love this song by Bishop Paul Moore that would say, Lord, if there's anything that you're doing on the face of the earth, don't keep me out of it. Wherever it is, 
I want to be in it. I want to be in the epicenter of the next move of God. I don't need to be preaching. I don't need to be singing. I could just be doing the landscaping. I mean, I just want to be part of the next move of God and somebody hungry to be used by God here. So Mordecai actually pushed her button on that. Like, hey, 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 he'll bypass you. And then he says, but maybe, who knows, you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Say it with me, such a time as this. Maybe you're here in California for such a time as this. Maybe you're sitting right now in the service for such a time as this. Such a time as this, could you please put this, the next one over please? Is the vision is the purpose. See, this is the problem. When we see people that start off good and don't finish well, many of them get caught up in the circle of influence when they should have been focused in the circle of vision. And when you have a bigger influence than your vision, you have a discrepancy. Can we have the next one, please? You have a discrepancy. What happens is you have a bigger circle of influence to your vision. And then you have a difference here. And this discrepancy is uh, scenarios like you're sitting in front of celebrities and you don't know why you're there. The Lord put you there for a vision. But you're so caught up on the fact that you're so influential and you can get into these celebrity parties and you get seduced by their world. See, this is the thing. When you have more influence than vision, you leave your identity as a thermostat to become a thermometer. You become a victim of your environment when in actuality the Lord was raising you up to set the climate of your society. See, when, when you have more influence than vision is when you sit in front of people that have money and then when you were supposed to be used by the Lord to give them purpose for their wealth, you get seduced by mammon. You, you, you were, you're in front of authorities in the Senate, in the Congress, in the governor's palace, and instead of pointing him to what the Bible says true justice is. You get, you get so seduced by the power. Does that make sense? The Lord is calling us to fill in that discrepancy. So one person asked me, hey, Teo, so, so how does that happen? I said, well, we can't pull. You know, if you, if you look at 1 Samuel chapter 11, if you, you can get there real quick with me, 1 Cha Samuel chapter 11 verse 1, it says that in the spring, verse 1 of 1 Samuel 11, at the time, say with me, for such a time. At the time when kings go off to war. See, see, there was a time where the purpose of the king was to lead his armies to war. For that such a time, David sent out Joab out with king's men and, his, and the whole Israelite army. He, he did not go himself. He sent out other people to fulfill his mission because he says, I will be here in my influence. Number two, one evening, David got up from his bed in Jerusalem and walked around on the roof of the palace. Do you get that? Because, see, there's this parallel here with Esther and David. They were so influential, now they have a palace of influence that they're hiding themselves behind that palace of influence that's keeping them from fulfilling the vision. And as he's there, you see, this is the thing. The discrepancy zone is where you go through unnecessary temptations. He didn't have to be there. But on the roof, he sees another man's wife. He shouldn't have even been in the place, in the first place, if he would have been fulfilling his vision. See, he got comfortable. He won too many wars. He was, he, he was too successful. He got comfortable. He's like, you know what, I'm just going to chill in the palace for tonight. I'm not going to go out to war. Joab, you take, your, you take your men, you guys do what I would typically be supposed to be doing. So somebody asked me, Teo, how do we solve this? Should I just ask the Lord to decrease my influence? And I said, please don't do it. What you should be asking the Lord is increase my vision. Increase my vision. 
increase my vision, increase my vision. Lord, Lord, I'm getting too comfortable. Lord, increase my vision. Lord, I'm, I'm too successful. I need more of a challenge. Can I just dream for something greater? Lord, I've, I've, I've seen my family change. Can I now increase my vision to see my community change? Lord, I've seen my community change. Can I see my, increase my vision to see my city change? Does that make sense? See, I tell my wife, Junior, mother of my three boys, I say, baby, my best, the best version of Teo Hayashi, let me tell you, the best version of Teo Hayashi is Teo Hayashi desperate, desperate, needing a miracle. It's not Teo Hayashi successful, comfortable, that I'm a jerk when I'm in that place. You know what I'm saying? I'll just be straight up with you. I don't want to be, you don't want to see a self-sufficient Teo Hayashi. You want to see a God-dependent Teo Hayashi. The best version of yourself is yourself needing a miracle. How many of you love miracles? Come on, come on, come on. Miracles. How many of you need a miracle? All right, all right, all right. I love miracles. I got miracle testimonies that I could, I could share with you. But let me tell you, wouldn't you agree with me? That the worst part of a miracle is right before the miracle happens. It's those 30 seconds before he's healed. It's those 30 seconds before the provision comes. It's those 30 seconds before the deliverance happens. It's the 30 seconds before mercy is extended to you. It's like, oh, this is going to go down. Oh, this is not good. This is not good. It's not good. Boom, God shows up. Right? Right? Now. Right before he shows up, wouldn't you agree that you're fully vulnerable to him? Right before he shows up, wouldn't you agree that you're in that place where Paul says, your strength has made be, has made perfect in my weakness? Right before he shows up, wouldn't you say you're completely tender and compassionate, saying, Lord, do whatever. I mean, how many of you haven't prayed like I've prayed so many times? Lord, if you just take me out of this, I promise you I will serve you for the rest of my life. I pray. Right? Come on, that's your best version. If you're not experiencing this desperate need for a miracle, you need to increase your vision. Lord is calling us to increase the vision. So how do we keep on transforming society? Ever-growing vision, ever-growing vision. The Lord is asking you to expand your vision circle. Number two, the Lord is also teaching us that true transformation, true kingdom transformation is from the inside out. It's from the inside out. It's not from the outside in, and that's, that's the problem with religion. And that's why we've turned away so many people because they think, yeah, it's about the rules. I'm, I've messed up. I can't, I, I can't live up to a part of that standard. This, is, this Jesus thing is not for me. Let me tell you something. When Jesus comes into your life, you start, you, you start going through this thing that Paul says, the things that I want to do, I don't want to do. The things that I should do, I, I'm, I'm doing. But see, the fact is, I, I remember this kid that came up to me and he said, Pastor, this is a few years ago, he said, I am, I need to confess some sin. After church, I'm like, yeah, 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 come here, let's talk, talk about it. No, 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 I, 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 need, I need to tell you, I am, I'm, so, I'm, I'm stuck in this. This vice, and he, he confesses his, his sin, right? And I'm like, all right, man, I'm going to pray with you, and you're going to get back up on your feet, and we're going to keep going. He says, okay. So he wipes his tears. He's encouraged now, and he goes his way. Three months later, he comes back. I see him again in church. Pat, all right, come here. I fell on that sin again. I say, okay, you confessed it. Now let's, let's pray. Lord's forgiven you. Get yourself back up. Let's keep going. He comes back the third time. Now, when he comes back the third time, he says, Pastor, I don't think I'm saved. I don't think I'm a Christian. I don't, I, 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 this, is a, this is, I think I'm a, I'm a farce. I say, oh, hold up, hold up. I said, when did you start getting involved with this kind of sin? 12 years old. Okay, when you were involved with this kind of sin when you were 12 years old, and you did that for six years until you met the Lord at 18, did you feel bad about yourself? No. Why not? 
because everybody did it. I did it. My friends did it. This was my new, it was my normal. So, so when did it stop becoming your normal and now you feel bad about it? After I found Jesus. After I got saved. So, so, so why are you questioning the fact that you're a Christian? Would it make sense that something got changed inside of you? And that's why you feel the need to confess. And I asked him, when have you confessed and come forward and never found grace? And he says, never. See, this is the thing. Religion will say it's got to be behaviors. It's got to be outward. When the Bible says it's inward. And we're all in a journey. Can I hear an amen? We're all in a journey. Now, see, this is the thing with Daniel, verse one, chapter 1, verse 8. Daniel is on a journey himself. He goes off as a slave to Babylon. He's taken captive. He's a young man. Some, some historians will say he was probably in between 14 to 16 years old. He's taken to a foreign land as a slave. And when he gets there, he's placed before him foods that were used in pagan rituals that were sinful rituals and he says I can't take part of that I'm going to contaminate myself if I take part of that and when when he proposes in his heart look at that verse 8 he says Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself see this is the thing if we want to see societies change societies will become a reflection of what we are as individuals does that make sense so Daniel says I need to change. I will purpose in my heart to not defile myself. Before I'm going to expect something corporately, I have to have the conviction individually. Before I expect authorities to do something about something that's ethically wrong, I need to see if I have my code of ethics aligned with the Bible. So Daniel says, I will purpose in myself, in my, in my own heart. Verse 11 says, Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So be, we begin with personal change. So he gathers his buddies and he says, hey guys, you know this food that they're offering us? This will defile us. These are foods that they've been used in, in pagan rituals. I mean, I mean, all sorts of demonic stuff have been happening over this food. We're going to take part of this. We can't take part of this. So they're like, whoa, I never thought about that. And so Daniel goes on discipleship mode with his buddies. And now his inner circle, can we have the next one? His inner circle now goes through change. Next slide, please. It, it says here, look at, look at him. He says, verse 12, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So it began I, it then extends to my circle of influence. Say with me, discipleship. I was, I was, I was talking uh, at this uh, forum with uh, young, young pastors and uh, Somebody asked me, what do you think is the new normal for church? I said, I think the new normal for church, part of the new normal for church is that discipleship is the new evangelism. It's always been actually, but now we're, we've been, after COVID, we, we've been real realizing, I mean, you either have it or you don't. It's discipleship, the new evangelism. And so he goes on, verse, chapter 3, verse 28. If you can just jump with me, Daniel 3, 28, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, you know, the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace... And as they're in the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angels, his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I make a decree. Say with me, decree. That any people, any nation or language which speaks anything against the God of Chadrick, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. Their house shall be made an ash sheep because there is no other God who can deliver like this. So finally we come into a societal change. 
So how does this happen? It begins with an individual impacting other individuals and finally a decree. See, the problem was with a lot of us Christians in the Western world is that we feel like our salvation is in politicians. If you could only pass a law that would be a biblical law, oh, you don't want to live biblical ethics, but you want him to pass a law. Oh, he needs to pass a law of morality, but you won't live a moral life. So you don't know, you got a bunch of kids coming up from Christian families. They don't want to do anything with church because they say, that's jacked up because you're telling us to do something you don't do. Sorry, I just had to go there. See, it's one of my life heroes is a guy called or was named William Wilberforce. He died. If you heard of William Wilberforce, I mean, he's old. I mean, 18, 1800s, British young dude came from money, came from well-educated uh, family. I mean, he doesn't know what to do with his influence. He's got so much, he doesn't know what to do with his money. And then suddenly, in a bet, true story, they were drinking in a pub. They got on a bet, him and his buddy. Who gets to be elected to the parliament first? Because of a bet, he goes into campaign and gets elected. So now he's in the parliament, he doesn't know what to do. 1830s. Or actually, this was like in 1810 or something like that. So he gets in there. He doesn't know what to do. And, and so he goes and says, I, I, need, I need wisdom. He looks for a pastor to get, get wisdom. The pastor leads him to Jesus. His name is John Noon. Pastor John Noon leads him to Jesus. And he says, you got to go on a retreat and you got to pray. Now that Jesus came into your life, he's transforming you. you got to pray and ask Jesus, why did he put you or allow you to be in the parliament? And find something that hurts Jesus' heart and make it hurt your heart bad enough for you to change so he goes on a retreat he comes back and he says holy spirit spoke to me i went to the bible the lord showed me that slavery is a sin he says i will work all the days of my life to emancipate slavery that was that was his 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 plight of life so he thinks i'm going to just walk in there and i'm going to change this so he walks into the parliament, he tries to pay, pass a bill, it doesn't go through. I mean, he's just getting opposition, he's getting criticism. So he retreats and he says, I got to do this the right way. So he gathers his buddies, all rich British boys with influence. And he says, we all want to serve Jesus, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And they're new at this. So he says, open your Bible. And he says, and he goes on and goes on and goes on. And they finally come to the conclusion, slavery is a sin. So they release all their slaves. So then he says, let's try to do this again. And they said, no, 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 let's do something different. So what did they do? For 40 years, they went around the Anglican church, the Church of England, and they would meet with ministers individually. And they did this campaign for over 40 years. They would meet and they say, do you own a slave minister? Yes, I do. Well, that's a sin. Oh, how come? Open the Bible. And they would disciple him. He would come under the conviction. He would repent, release a slave. Now, what happened was Sunday he would go before his parishioners and say, the Lord spoke to me. I've released a slave. I was in sin. I've repented. Who here owns a slave? They would raise their hands like, you're in sin, you're in sin, you're in sin. Come here, repent. And then suddenly that church, all slaves released. They did that for 40 years, church after church after church after church after church. So then after 40 years, maybe three months before he died, he goes into the parliament floor. Now, I'll tell you this, his biography says not every member of the parliament agreed with him, but the critical mass was reached where culture was so discipled by biblical concepts. They were pressured by the culture saying, do what's ethical, do what's right, do what's moral, do what's biblical. And they passed on that law. Great Britain abolished slavery. America is under pressure. America abolishes slavery. Latin America is under pressure. And that's how this man became the first domino that started taking down the other ones. How he did personal change, then community change. Can we have the next one? And then finally, societal change. The Lord is calling us to go maybe the slower route, but the one that's going to last. Can I hear an amen to that? 
and I'll finalize with Luke 11. Can you open with me to Luke 11? And I was telling people in the 9 o'clock service, I grew up in a hyper charismatic church. Like Pentecostal to its core. And so, I mean, I, I, I remember just seeing miracles, signs and wonders, people getting delivered. I mean, it was, it was a holy mess. Sometimes I miss it. Come on. And, and I, still, I still believe in it and we still see it. But see, this is the thing about it. Luke eleven twenty four 24 talks about deliverance ministry. It, Jesus says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. There's a vacuum there. It's empty. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. The way church, let me tell you something. The Lord is calling us not for just an event. The Lord is inviting us to a process. Can I hear an amen? True transformation is not just kicking out the demon. And I love that. I mean, my, our ministry is called dunamis. I mean, if you know dunamis... It's the explosive power of the Holy Spirit through signs and wonders. But this is what I kind of understood. You, you can get a miracle, but something needs to be done after the miracle. Right? And so we, we, we can, uh, you know, stretch out our hands and say to Washington, D.C., all corruption be gone. We can kick out the spirit of injustice, kick out the spirit of corruption. But let me tell you, if we don't fill in that vacuum, it's going to get worse, right? If we reach our hands out to Hollywood and say, all spirit of lust and morality get out. But if we don't raise up artists, if we don't raise up filmmakers, if we don't raise up movie executives... There is a vacuum that we release, we, we allow in that place, and it gets worse. So what am I saying? Yes to the event. And this is what I feel so strong as we look at society. You can uh, show here on the last one, please. You see every society made up of these seven spheres. And the Lord is looking for a church that will raise up disciples to go into the marketplace, to go into education, to go into to arts and entertainment, the celebration, to go into a business world. I loved what I just heard about the initiative that this church had to create jobs. I mean, that's what we need. You know, and I feel that the Lord is raising up the way, and I'll, I'll speak to this prophetically, Pastor Marco, and uh, you judge this, but I, I really sense from the Lord, you've been experiencing the, the, the wake of revival. But I also saw that it's going to be a revival unto Reformation. And, and the Lord is going to raise up entrepreneurs out of this place. You know, Reformation like William Wilberforce was a reformer. You know, people that are going to devote themselves to education. People that are going to devote themselves, you know, to journalism. I mean, these, these are going to be people that are going to understand that you don't go Monday morning to work. You go Monday morning to worship. What you do is your worship. Does that make sense? And the Lord is raising up people that understand we don't just kick out evil in these spheres. We fill them up with kingdom disciples. So wherever you are, you say, I am a kingdom disciple. I am a kingdom ambassador. If you could just stand to your feet. I want to pray with you as we finish off this morning. And I just feel such a, a strong anointing in this place for, to really raise up reformers. I feel the Lord is raising up agents of transformation. I want to pray for you and, uh, for that specifically. And then I want to pray for something else at the end. But if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you this morning, saying, hey, I'm changing you so that you would change. I've transformed you so that you would transform. I didn't just save you so that you wouldn't burn in hell. I saved you so that you would transform everything that was under hell's influence. So today he's, he's convocating the kingdom ambassadors of change. If you're here and say, Lord, use me. Just raise your hands wherever you are. I want to pray with you. If you're saying, Lord, I want to I do kingdom work. I, I'm engaged in the great commission. Here my Lord, send me. Send me to my job, to the marketplace, to my neighborhood. Send me, Lord, to the spheres of power and government. Send me, Lord, to arts entertainment. Send me, Lord, to communications, to the educational system. Send me, Lord. I want to change. 
I'm not undergoing change just so that I'd be a better version of myself. I'm undergoing change so that I could be used by you. So, Father, right now, you see these hands. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would continue to touch these hands that are saying, here am I, send me. And we say, Holy Spirit, would you ignite a fire in our hearts that we cannot contain, that we can't control. Would you set us on this journey? And I know this church already is on that journey. But Father, would you just take us through deeper conviction that we're here to do kingdom work until you come back. As we wait for you to come back, we're doing kingdom work. We're expanding the kingdom's influence. It's not about just getting to heaven. It's about bringing heaven to earth. And here we are, Lord. Use me to bring heaven to earth. I pray, Lord, that you would seal this in our hearts. And with your eyes still closed, I just want to, you can just put your hands down. I, I want to just continue in the same spirit. I want to talk to people that are out there saying, hey, Teo. I want to be part of this initiative, man. I want to be part of this commission. I want to be part of this team of world changers. And, and I'm, I'm here to tell you, if, if you haven't been changed by Jesus, if he hasn't come into your life and, and turned everything upside down, you know, he, he's, he's dying to do that. Uh, that's, that's what he wants the most. And, and maybe you said, I've, I've done that already before, but I'm, I'm away from, from his ways to... This morning, today, I feel it's a morning of reconciliation. It's a morning of salvation. If you're saying, Jesus, I want to be in this team. I want to be part of this family. I'm telling you, you need to say yes to a new birth. You need to say yes to, to self being saved by, by his grace. And if you're saying, I, I want to do that for the first time. Or if you're saying, I've, I'm away, but I want to come back today. I'm way out there. I've done it before, but I realize I got to come back. There's a mission I need to fulfill. There's a family that I need to belong. There's a father that calls me his own. I want to be part of this. If you're saying, yes, that's me, wherever you are, I want to pray for you. And I just want to ask you if you could just raise your hand really up so I could see you. If you could just raise your hand really up. I see you. I see you over there in the back. I see you. I see those hands out in the back. I see those hands to my right. I see that hand right there. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you've raised your hands, I want to pray with you. Can you just come out of your seat real quick? Come out. Come out real quick. I want to pray for you saying, I want to make this decision for the first time or I want to come back to Jesus today. I have a mission to fulfill. Come on. I, I have a purpose to live. Come up. Come up real quick. Those hands that I just saw. If you can just get out of your seat. Would you come out, please? Would you come out? We want to pray with you.